This is a production of Cornell University. Hello, and welcome to the Philip Freund, I don't know how to say that word, and I should, Freund Freund Prize for Creative Writing Alumni. Um, and it's sponsored by the Creative Writing Program and Department of English. I want to ask everybody to please silence or turn off all devices, except for your mind, and um, to thank the Freund in endowment for this opportunity to honor our alumni. Books by the authors are available here. I also want to thank Buffalo Street Books for showing up and um, helping us. It's very important to, to have the books here. And please join us for a reception after the readings upstairs in the English Department Lounge, which is 258, number 258, uh, Golden Smith. And you can have your book signed there and converse with the writers. But I do have to implore you not to glom onto the writers here after the reading, because then we can't get them to the reception. And uh, we're very eager to get everybody upstairs, and you can talk to them there. So, so please, um, please go up to the reception to talk to the writers. They'd love to talk with you. Dorothy Chan is our first reader. She's the author of three books. Chinese Girl Strikes Back, which is forthcoming from Spork Press, Revenge of the Asian Woman, and Attack of the 50-Foot Centerfold. I think there's a thread going there that you can recognize. She also has a chapbook, Chinatown Sonnets. A 2014 finalist for the Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Fellowship, Dorothy's work has appeared in Poetry, American Poetry Review, and many other distinguished magazines. She received her PhD in creative writing poetry at Florida State University, her MFA in poetry at Arizona State, and her BA in English at Cornell. She's an assistant professor of English at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire and poetry editor of Hobart. Dorothy Chan's vivid imagistic poems are unsettling in the risks they take. Their pushback and back talk is contained in beautifully made lines that revel in the welter of Asian American identity. This isn't Chinatown from the movies, she warns. With volcanic insouciance, Chan mocks and dismantles stereotypes of Asian culture and subverts the fetishizing of Asian women as exotic sexual objects, noting, I'm not your Asian cupcake, your Chinese wet dream in slit red slip and pink kimono. The feral feminist content of her work might be deemed shameless, a term often applied to women doing things that subvert the cultural expectations for women. Unseemly things, fun things, shameless hussy things. Maybe it's because Chan was born in the year of the snake. She writes seriously badass sonatas. I'm sorry, sonnets. She probably could write sonatas too. <laughs> badass sonnets, hilarious, imaginative, full of the riotous grit of lived experience. Food is a central trope. Yet Chan shows an appetite not only for tripe and noodle soup, but for all of the world's vibrant pleasures and experiences. We eat with our eyes, she notes. And her poems offer a technicolor feast of materiality and popular culture that is funny, exuberant, and truly surprising. For instance, in Triple Sonnet for My Crushes, she confesses, no one thinks Bing Crosby is hot except me. <laughs> that is true. She's one of the most unrepressed, unveiled poets imaginable. For as she says, a snake only dresses to shed. With this in mind, it's with pleasure and a sense of delicious foreboding that I welcome you to the Dorothy Chan experience. Please prepare to be amazed. Hi.
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today and joining us for this reading. Alice, um, thank you again for that introduction, and thank you for your uh, mentorship. You are uh, one of my inspirations, so thank you again. Uh, let's have some fun now. I'm going to start off with a new poem. It's in the current issue of Poetry Magazine titled Triple Sonnet for Black Hair. Triple Sonnet for Black Hair. My mother warns me not to blow dry my hair too hard, turning it from black to rust, and I must wear my black hair proudly, black, the color of clothing my grandmother hates because young women should always wear red or pink, the colors of luck and youth, black. The color of wedding dress the reality TV starlet circa 2006 wants, but she knows walking down the aisle in black will break her mother's heart. In fact, red is the color of wedding dresses in Chinese culture. Even if the bride wears white for the ceremony, she'll change into red for the dinner. Hello, 10 course meal of my dreams that starts with a meat platter of roasted pork and how guests go crazy for the abalone and swallows nest soup with crab meat. And of course, there's a chicken, a fish, a duck, a lobster, roll call. In fact, at Chinese funerals, relatives of the deceased don't wear black, but white. In fact, eight's the lucky Chinese number, not seven. And at dim sum, my grandmother makes sure she orders eight dishes, not seven, but nine's all right, too. <laughs> eight. Like the number of legs on a spider. Spider, black, like my hair, that my mother warns me not to blow dry too hard, turning it into rust. And I remember my sixth grade science experiment of lighting a cigarette, watching how the smoke changed the spider's web spinning. And black because it's hypnotic, like little black dresses on gorgeous women, or how I prefer my lingerie in black over white, but red is probably the best. An ode to sexiness, an ode to the color of my culture and history and people. And I want to feel like a million dollars and be a million dollars and black the color of my late dog buzzy a sky terrier twice as long as he was low my mother once joking said he looked like a giant rat or a licorice bunny or a furry snake or a dragon in some iterations of love majestic in my dreams how i miss him after these dream visits black the color of my wet hair in the morning Thank you. I also just wanted to take a few minutes to thank uh, Cornell University for having us, to the Cornell English Department, Arts and Sciences. Uh, thank you to Daniel, Ruth, and Nicholas for joining me on the stage today. Um, I also wanted to take the time to thank the wonderful Lynn Lopper who helped arrange all of this, um, along with the English Department, of course, and a special shout out to my mentors, uh, Lyra, Alice, Michael, and Stephanie. Thank you so much for your many years of guidance here. Thank you so much, and of course, um, to my friends and to all of you for being here. So I also wanted to do a little follow-up. So I have a kind of a soft spot for the sonnet, actually. It's 14 lines, so it's kind of romantic, like Valentine's Day. Um, it's also conversational with its like 10 syllables. And um, I do a lot of like triple sonnets, which is um, obviously three sonnets in a row, because it's this kind of logic where if you love something, you know, why not just have one? Like, why can't you have like three or like eight or like a thousand, you know? And so that's kind of like where the idea comes from. It's this like excess of like wanting and wanting and wanting but being able to uh, quench that desire and create more desire for the reader and obviously um, also as Alice mentioned earlier I write about like Chinese culture a lot uh, so this next poem is titled the Chinese zodiac snake cocktail and it's in uh, revenge of the Asian woman and I am also the year of the snake so I identify a lot with that creature the Chinese zodiac snake cocktail According to the Chinese zodiac, snake and rat meet at a bar and she slithers away, sipping something a little smoky, a little sexy, a little jalapeno mixed with tequila because light my fire, baby, light my fire, she's thinking, ready to devour the rat man whole. And the snake woman's a seductress, fire embodied, the face and body that launch a million ships into the night, that oversexed little human being that really means no harm. Unlike Eve's serpent of the candied apple, 
but really, who wouldn't have been seduced by that creature so long and graceful, long and graceful, that baristas had to name a coffee after her, the snake in the grass made of mint and mocha and a shot of espresso, ice me, baby, ice me, or what about the cocktail of gin and vermouth and lemon and ice, and let her sneak up on you, and why don't you imagine you're stuck in the sheets, a boa constrictor, slithering up your way, and would you push her off? You've got to admit that even if you're terrified, you're a little turned on, and the snake woman is a seductress, ready to swallow the rat man whole, and he loves how she's wise, good with money, and a little arrogant, and in Chinese culture, if you're called a snake, it's a real compliment, a good eye, the cunning to succeed, beautiful almond eyes, and I learned this when I'm six, stunned, facing a yellow snake caged up in a pet store in Pennsylvania. And when I go home, my father reads me a fortune, tells me I'm a snake. And when I'm 14, losing my temper, my mother tells me about the family fortune teller, Vince's before I was born, how he warned my parents about my temper. If I lost it too often, I'd end up a housewife with no children. And in that moment, at 14, I want to cry at my kitchen table. But my mother tells me in every case, I marry a handsome man and live happily ever after. And I'm not romantic, but that tale's carried me through adulthood. The way I think about the animals of the zodiac, and the snake woman's a seductress, ready to eat the rat man whole, and she's compatible with roosters and oxen, but rabbits are just too much sex for too little time. But there's just something about a snake and a rat playing cat and mouse at a bar, how she slithers away, how she's hard to read, swallows him whole, he's intrigued, and they forget about everyone and everything in the world in the scene of tension you could cut with a knife. And it's sexy the way she wraps herself around him, and the rest is history. And if the fortune teller is right, I can hardly wait to swallow my rat hole. Um, so I'm also really influenced by uh, many aspects of popular culture. And so growing up, I actually watched a lot of uh, soap operas uh, because of my mother. She had this like fascination with all my children. And so I reflect a lot on popular culture, especially um, within the mindset of the immigrant. Because t uh, immigrant mentality, my parents both coming from Hong Kong, when my mom was watching these soap operas, she kind of saw that as like the American dream because all those characters are wealthy and they barely like have to do anything at their jobs and they're glamorous and so there's that idea as well so um, this next poem um, is about was also like my obsession for a few months it's about my mother's obsession but this poem itself was actually one of my obsessions because it's about this idea where one night I was like what if I had two heads you know like what would happen like can that be a seduction technique like what happens with that so and then I just ended up just like talking like whenever I ran into people I'd be like you know I have this poem about what would happen if I had two heads and they'd think I was crazy but it's fine the poem got written <laughs> the soap opera of my body, two-headed version. Would you make love to me if I had two heads? I promise it'll be fun. A two for the price of one big box department store weekly special. Just add water, and my extra head magically sprouts out of my neck, birthing quicker than the chia pet I was dying to bring home back in the 90s, with a grocery cart full and the checkout stand tabloids and scandal. And is Elvis really alive, and can our bodies defy gravity, sucking on lemon pasta lines at checkout? Because if Eve had three faces, I can definitely take two as I wonder what if my new head transforms into the evil twin of the soap opera of my body the lady who lingers in the magenta teddy with matching garters because nighttime looks should never be lazy and she's sipping plum wine and nibbling on a couple slices of sashimi at midnight but the extra head hires a hitman to murder her ex-husband in the middle of the pines of Pennsylvania and in the next morning she's caught ravaging the friend's dreamboat of a fiance on a yacht hey sailor let let me don your cat, rise and fall like the waves rise and fall. I'll rub your chest hair girl on top. She's the flame that won't go out, irresistible to both men and women, and now I smell trouble. But if I'm not the one blooming the extra head, I'd love to make love to the woman who dare grow two heads. The title of a sci-fi flick that's galaxies better than the one about the man so awestruck. He cloned the woman he fell into lust with, and in the end was unable to tell the difference. 
Just imagine the sugar and spice, the double delight, two scoops of ice cream, one cotton candy, one dark cherry, the cocoa and rum of two heads wrapping around your 1,000 thread count Egyptian sheets, or better yet, your two ladies whose legs transform into the lower halves of snakes slithering in the sex tornado of your own Eden, like the M of Michelangelo's Sistine ceiling, the artist's serpent, a feminine, feminine long heavy tail, her arm reaching for Eve, sealing the deal like Edie, the drag queen superstar host of a Vegas strip sex review up there in the stars, a glittery black disco Bob Mackie share moment. Oh, Edie, you beauty, I love the way you instruct couples to kiss and everyone to howl, and you make me want to defy gravity. The next time I lock lips long and slow, long and slow, let's get out of this world into a universe where I'm finally ready to admit that yes, I am just a little bit romantic lover. Feed me, sprinkle me, scoop up that whipped cream. Thank you. Uh, my parents currently live in Vegas. They retired there, so um, it also coincides because I've always had this fascination with Liberace. And it was known that uh, Liberace had this reputation of buying multiple houses just so he could like stuff two of everything he liked in there. Excess. So another triple sonnet. Triple sonnet for Liberace's white pianos and dream houses. When I was a kid, I dreamt of being a goddess atop a white piano, wearing angel wings straight out of the Victoria's Secret catalog of my childhood imagination. And it's a little alarming looking back at all the black garters of my dreams, how I wanted a white piano in the middle of the living room when I was six. And when I told my parents in the middle of the Yamaha store, they looked at me like I was crazy because how tacky. And at six, I just wanted some Liberace rhinestone piano goodness of Lee's Prime, asking the audience for casserole recipes and Liberace, you do you and I'll do me, and a little showmanship of candelabras goes a long way, light up. And I might as well have wished for a heart-shaped bathtub with accompanying pink plush carpet like Jane Mansfield, the poor man's Marilyn, and Jane, I feel you, but I'm never second best. And I picture Jane in pigtails wearing a red baby doll, her piece of a meat of a man, Mr. Universe himself, Mickey Hargitay, building her a pool to declare his love. And I'm not into bodybuilders, but there's just something about a man who can lift me because I have enough trouble feeling feminine as is. And let's play dream house, the way Liberace kept buying and buying and buying properties just to fill them up with everything, salt and pepper, and lace my corset up like the Las Vegas showgirl who no longer exists. And I miss seeing her dance to the Titanic number. And don't we all have fantasies on a boat? And I think about that moment on The Bachelor when the women visit the Moulin Rouge wearing bejeweled headpieces and cutouts. And at Charlotte Airport, I gawk at the rhinestone tops in the luggage store. Your breath revealed and what about those rhinestone dildos named after Wonderland characters I'll take a Cheshire cat cunning and everything Vegas is goddess 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 like garden statues outside gentlemen's clubs and it's perverted how perverted things make me feel nostalgic the little girl who wanted a white piano uh, and of course here's my title poem um, thank you everyone uh, Revenge of the Asian Woman. Revenge of the Asian Woman. If I played roller derby, my name would be Yellow Fever, knocking out all those white boys from college who used to whisper sweet nothings to me in Mandarin, trying to seduce through the pure poetry of simplified Chinese on hand-delivered letters. And come on, this is the 21st century, and I'm not here to make friends or be your fourth grade pen pal just because you're lonely after watching tentacle porn for the first time, and you don't understand real art, how to sit during tea ceremonies or where to watch watch the best Chinese opera, and how buying kimono at Epcot doesn't qualify for a pass to Tokyo Fashion Week, and you expect praise, idolatry, applause from the entire Chinese population for your summers in Shanghai selling real estate, working for daddy, 
an old white boy, how you think every form of Asian food is a dumpling because they're also cute and small, cute and small, just like your favorite type of girl with dark hair and red lips that you want to display as trophies, as gotta catch them all Japanese collectibles, as vintage dolls from the mainland, and they're all interchangeable, and all of this is too good for you. So don't you dare tell me how to pronounce nigiri when you can't even chuck sake like a CEO, or tell me where to get the best Hong Kong buffet when you can't stomach red bean and oyster sauce and don't know the difference between teas, and I don't have time to help you pick out a soy sauce, so just accept the fact that I look great in gold short shorts and will never take you back to my homeland. Thank you. Wow, was that a hurricane? <laughs> I'm uh, Robert Morgan. Nicholas Friedman, MFA class of uh, 2012, is the author of Petty Thief, this book, winner of the New Criterion Poetry Prize. His poems have appeared in uh, Poetry, Yale Review, The New York Times, New Criterion, and many other magazines. He served as a Stegner Fellow and a Jones Lecturer at Stanford and received a Ruth Lilly Fellowship from the Poetry Foundation. Uh, currently, he lives in uh, Syracuse with his wife and son. Nick's poems have the authority of form, rhyme and meter. In an age when we see little craft or subtle thought in contemporary poetry, Friedman's work stands out above the easy sentiment, predictable opinions, and sloppy lines we are so used to seeing. With precision, craft, tact, Friedman celebrates the art that conceals art the playfulness and sleight of hand and sleight of voice of the street magician, the carnival performer. Many of his poems turn on sly humor. Others are elegies for an uncle he never knew, an elder lost to dementia. Friedman takes special delight in performance at county fairs, circuses, the busker, the contortionist, the unpredictable antics of a Cheeto's bag and win. The poet even Bolin has said of Friedman's poems, the images and emblems that move through these poems suggest a world in which magic might occur, but seldom prevails, and where the only stay against time is accurate and musical language, which is certainly to be found in this work. Please join me in welcoming Nicholas Friedman. Well, thank you, Bob, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, I hope I can deliver on some of the promises that Bob has just made. And uh, I know I will at least with the first one because I, I will offer you the, the Cheetos bag straight away. <laughs> And uh, by the way, this is a poem that I, I hope will be obsolete before Christmas. Distracted by an empty Cheetos bag. On a sunny afternoon in the best year of my life, as palm trees cast stabs of shadow on honeycomb brick, I watched an empty bag of Cheetos billow with the wind and scrape past my feet. No one else saw this and so it was all mine. A fine aluminum sail moving graceful as a theorem. It was irrefutable. My mental grocery list vanished, meaning fennel might have been what I'd meant to buy, likely as eggs or ground turkey. A Cheetos bag, a Cheetos bag. It skated off toward other trash, I guess. 
Instead of the store, I went home, where I undressed, my good suit in a pool of its own melting where it fell. I sat on the couch in just my underwear and watched the ticker tape of news till dark. But the empty bag kept skating at my feet, or my mind's feet. And as the president, himself in alarming orange, dictated my fears to me, I thought about fingers still carrying that same faint glow long after the last Cheeto vanished, its little crook of mostly air digested now. Don't ask me why, but these days I can't stop eating them, letting the bright crumbs gather on my lips. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Too well? Uh, this next poem is a little bit newer. It's not in the, the book. Um, it describes something that uh, I did with a friend when we were much younger, something I'm not entirely proud of, uh, but no one was hurt. And I'll give you the short introduction, which is that we, we constructed a makeshift hot air balloon out of a dry cleaning bag. And it went about as well as you'd expect. Gravity. Bulbous, and for a moment floating on a palm. The fine, dry cleaning bag fills with air, lighter than air, and begins ascending like a bright idea. Above us, the striped McDonald's straws we lashed and studded with birthday candles hold a reticle against the sky. Weightlessness is the target at which we've fired this taut balloon jittering as it passes the pointed tips of fir trees in the lawn, then clears the cat's cradle of telephone wires. A slight wind steers it over rows of sided homes where it drips its dainty tears of fire onto rooftops until a gust collapses the bag, as anyone might have expected, and a slack comet falls out of sight. A light ticks on in the house across the street, but otherwise, our handiwork seems to have altered nothing. A sheer cloud hides and shows the moon like lace. And a siren, too far off to worry us, warps through the clean night air. It's another um, poem from my childhood. Also not an entirely happy memory, but everyone's OK. And as long as I'm talking, uh, I would again like to echo the thanks offered before to Cornell, to all of the wonderful faculty, and to my fellow writers. I had to get permission from my wife um, before I sent this poem into the world because she speaks a little bit. And I uh, said, is this, is this accurate? And she said, no, but it's fine. Uh, and this, this poem is uh, based on a, a drawing by Watteau, uh, which hangs in the Getty. It's called The Remedy. She looks calmed by the nurse's hand, which reaches for a sloping buttock while the other readies a clister syringe. I stand plausibly between this drawing and another, one with no nudity, no nipple brushing the red crayon duvet, on which a woman lies in half repose, waiting for that rush of warm water. I swear she's almost smiling. For nearly an hour, my wife has been lost in a Flemish world of peasantry and the hunt. But now I notice her returning, and when she's just behind me, I ask what she thinks. I like it, she says. I'm guessing you like the colors. Or is it just her nice, a joke, meaning the softness of that curve, my attention for it? Of course, it's true. But more than Watteau's willing figure, I'm thinking of my own, on its side, knees drawn up like a child napping. And I'm thinking how the gown slides down off my thigh, bearing the full nakedness of my back like in a worry dream. 
A nurse checks the propofol IV, and the doctor asks if I'm all right with being observed by an intern. After I say okay, a woman enters, white-coated, stunningly young. I'm thinking of the gown's tiny red poppies and how they're suddenly absurd she is so beautiful. I'm thinking of that humid afternoon my brother took an aluminum bat to the face when Danny hit a home run into the neighbor's lawn. Danny rounded two makeshift bases before noticing the blood that came in rills from my brother's nose. He just sort of moaned, his look far off. I rounded the side of the house, leaving him to bleed while I shook by the flower garden. Later, I tore down all my plastic pennants and fell asleep on the floor with the lights on. Summer ended that year in the middle of June. What is it? My wife asks, squinting at the sketch. And I tell her about how, when I was much younger, I could sleep anywhere, under the copper beach, or on the itchy red mat in my parents' foyer, if I lay on one side and brought my knees up the way kids do, not meaning to forget. And I'll, I'll end with a, a poem that uh, I think describes what is probably my greatest fear, and that is flying. And it's called In Flight. We suffer the cabins choked and common air and touch half willingly. For work her pleasure. Attendants trundle carts from nose to tail, dispensing coke, V8, and blackish coffee. One with a thin gray scarf and brunette bob reaches for cocktail napkins and a bag of peanuts when the plane quakes suddenly and dips us like a bobber. A light dings on. I count the smooth blue seats, doing the math they'll use to make a headline out of us. An infant cries out like a tiny engine. I've nearly hummed my way through every verse of Oh, my darling Clementine, the second we stagger into calm. Somehow, I'm eating a bag of peanuts, mouthing the ductile foil into a silver shape, shaking them out. The flight attendant's unchanged face stares down from the narrow parenthetical of her hair, saying, sir, and then, sir, until I realize she's calling me, blinking a generous morse across the seats. A whiskey, thank you, yes. Outside my window, 30,000 feet below our path, a river has bunched itself into omegas, blinding where the sun moves over them, while here, above all that, the body shudders and carries us along. Thank you. pleasure to introduce Ruth Joffrey. Uh, Ruth Joffrey graduated from Cornell in 2011 with a BA in English and Creative Writing, and she went on to earn an MFA from University of Iowa. She now lives in Seattle and teaches at the Hugo House. She's what I think is called a triple threat, uh, working in three genres. Her story collection, Night Beast, was published by Grove Atlantic in 2018. And she also is a published poet and nonfiction writer whose work has appeared in Kenyon Review, Gulf Coast, Prairie Schooner, and more. And today, we'll hear her read fiction. When I asked Ruth if she had any pithy words to offer about her book, Night Beast, she said, I've discovered that telling people my brand is basically lesbians and nightmares gets them most excited. <laughs> Perhaps find a way to work in that phrase. While writing in the tradition of authors such as Mary Gateskill and Kelly Link, Ruth Joffrey manages to be sui generis, 
a singular young writer reconfiguring the possibilities of narrative. The dissident, imperiled characters in Night Beast are intricately drawn and deeply engaging. They're often young women who live outside cultural boundaries and whose forms of escape, from running free in the woods to sleepwalking, are fascinating and inventive. At times, the narrative surface cracks to reveal a subterranean layer, a glowing interior world that is nonetheless part of this world, an imagined terrain that seems uncannily real. A character on the verge of a breakup after a miscarriage imagines she's in a luxury hotel designed to fly as a means of perpetually prolonging sunset and deferring nightfall, a strangely lovely metaphor for disavowed endings. In another story, Nitrate Nocturnes, a woman's wrist is, quote, lit from within like a lightning bug by a digital timer that tells the predestined hour when she will meet her soulmate. Like everyone in that fantastic story, she'll take waiting partners, erotic placeholders, till the real thing comes along. But plot summaries can't convey the visionary freshness of these subtle fictions. Traces of memoir, fable, gritty realism, crime, horror, and romance fiction flit through, leavened by dark wit. It's a dream to read such powerfully convincing sojourns into other realities, genders, and genres, including the genre Joffrey probably invented, lesbians and nightmares. <laughs> but whatever we call it, it's wicked good fiction. Please welcome Ruth Joffrey. Thank you, Alice. And um, I also wanted to say thank you to Stephanie Vaughn and, and Michael Cook. Um, you're all hugely important to me when I was an undergrad here. And I don't know that I'd be the writer I am today without you guys. Um, and I thank you all for coming. Thank you to Lynn and everyone who coordinated this. And, and um, thank you to Cornell. It was a four years that really changed and shaped who I am. Um, I also wanted to point out that um, one of the stories that Alice mentioned, Nitrate Nocturnes, does take place here in Ithaca. Um, and it, a scene from it is uh, set it, at Cornell Cinema, which if you haven't gone to, you should. Um, the scene is of an elegant winter party, which I have on good authority, may be coming back this year. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and with that, I'm going to read from the title story, Night Beast. Somnambule, I called her. Somnambule pirouetting in the night. I shivered the first time I found her pressed against me in bed, her cold, insistent fingers working their way under my shirt. My brother had told me that she was a sleepwalker, that sometimes he'd wake up in the middle of the night and have to ease Sydney down off the table or the couch because she was dancing with her eyes closed and didn't realize how close her head was to hitting the fan. He hadn't mentioned the sex or the touching, but he probably hadn't expected it to be an issue. And of course, I didn't tell him. I thought it would embarrass him. He and Sydney had been dating for three years by then, and he'd started thinking about marriage. He told me in confidence that it was time to either get married or break up. He'd had enough of Sydney's empty commitments. And yet, she was the one who called to invite me to the wedding. It was on a Saturday, the third Saturday in April at Sydney's parents' house in Connecticut. My brother had hinted on several occasions that her family was rich, rich, but I'd never met them and I didn't think anything of it when I read the word estate on their wedding invitations. Sydney had merely said the ceremony would be held in her parents' backyard. She failed to mention that this yard included statues, gardens, and a little brook her parents had installed to mark where their property ended and their neighbors began. It didn't surprise me in the slightest that they had just one neighbor, a pediatric surgeon whose father had been the governor of Connecticut. When I pulled up in front of the house, I considered turning around and skipping the wedding entirely, but then a truck drove up beside me and someone directed me toward the garages and I resigned myself to the fact that this was happening. She was going to marry him right in front of me. 
My brother didn't answer his phone, so I walked around the estate, half expecting to learn he'd fled the country at the last minute. Someone told me that he was in the back helping put up the big tent, but when I arrived, six men were working together to drive metal stakes deep into the grass, and my brother was gone. A tall, silver-haired man in a gray button-down shirt had taken his place, watching the men with an expression of disbelief and, it seemed, mild resentment. This was his backyard, I realized, his daughter getting married just two months after, after getting engaged. When he saw me, his face went blank, and his hand slipped out of his pocket so he could shake mine. Austin Carver, you're looking for your brother? I nodded. Only then did I realize that Austin wasn't wearing shoes. He's in the attic. Sydney wanted him to find something blue for her. Inside, I discovered that Sydney's dancer friends had arrived en masse not long before and that the pretty limber lot of them had camped out in the living room to practice a number they'd, pre they'd prepared for the rehearsal dinner. When I asked if any of them knew where my brother was, a particularly flexible woman rose into an arabesque and said, very casually, as if it should be obvious, ruining Sydney's life. Finally, one of two piano players pointed vaguely at the stairs, and I left to search the second and third floors. By my count, there were five guest rooms, all but one of them filled with suitcases and garment bags that Sydney's guests had brought. I had yet to encounter any of my brother's friends, whose white ties and black dress shoes would have given them away immediately. Sydney never dressed up like that unless she had to. When I found her, she was lying on her side with her back to the door, wearing a black tank top and skinny jeans. Her side rose and fell softly with her breathing, but otherwise she didn't move. Sorry, I heard my brother say from the attic stairs, it's been hectic. I nodded into the room. Should we wake her? Something in him seemed to deflate when he saw her. Disappointed, he sat on the edge of the bed and took her arm gently. Sydney, Sydney, Gemma's here. And indeed there I was. Sydney rubbed her eye. Did you find Mr. Snuffles? My brother shook his head. I can look again later. She sat up, apologizing because she hadn't meant to sleep so long. I just had to get away from the music for a while. It was so dreary. She said all this to me because I hadn't been there, but then turned to him watching his face as she sighed. I shut the door so her guests couldn't hear it when he reminded her that it was her idea to have her friend's band play the wedding, that she was the one who'd insisted on having a less traditional ceremony so she shouldn't complain. It wasn't my fight and didn't strike me as a particularly nasty one, so when he said he was sorry but babysitting a bunch of drunks wasn't exactly his idea of a nice wedding, I decided I didn't need to be there anymore and asked if there was some place I might shower. I might have said it louder than necessary because Sydney said, oh, then directed me toward my room. We wouldn't be sharing. It was impossible to picture Sydney and my brother together. Their interactions only minutes before began to warp and ease apart in the steam as if they'd happened separately, independently, joined only by the efforts of a tired mind working ceaselessly through the night. At some point, I stopped moving and just stood there, letting the water cascade over me until I forgot why it was there. My first thought was that it was strange, their haste to be married. He'd only proposed in February, and he'd always wanted a big wedding, the kind you had to plan for months in advance. I knew for a fact that Sydney wasn't pregnant. When I'd last visited them at their brownstone in Brooklyn, she had come downstairs, found me in the living room, and stripped in front of the blue light of the television. She'd woken up just as she knelt between my legs and then kissed me gently, hesitantly, awake for perhaps the first time since this all started. I understood her then. I knew she didn't love him. I stepped out of the shower, wrapping my hair in a powder blue towel. I paused a moment at the window to feel the cold air emanating from the glass. It was a dark, chilly day, and the white folds of the tent were flapping in the breeze. Its stakes had finally been secured, and the hired hands were moving tables around. Austin was there, speaking to one of the crew members. As I watched, he passed in and out of sight first entering the frame from the right and then exiting, still barefoot and still speaking, alone under the windowsill. 
I decided to take my time getting ready for the party. Sydney had said it was going to be a casual dinner, and though I'm sure she didn't mean for me to ignore my brother's knock or spend half an hour languishing around in my bra, trying to decide whether to do without it, that was just what I did. I laid my clothes out neatly on my bed, then stood there with the sleeves of my blouse pinched between my fingers. Occasionally, I flicked the sleeve around as if enticing a shy partner onto the dance floor. When I finally emerged, the house was quiet. I descended from the third floor in a state of waning anticipation, hearing no voices, making no introductions, only listening to the sound of my skirt rubbing against my legs. In the kitchen, I found a woman washing a dish at the sink. She wasn't 30, but she wore the pinned back hair and full length skirt of someone who has longed all her life to be 50 and impossibly elegant. Oh, she said, you must be Gemma. I was standing in the doorway, my hand resting on the frame. Where is everyone? Outside, you hungry? Her hand guided me to the buffet on the counter, falling easily to the small of my back as she described each dish with exceeding care. Here, flat iron steak, pan seared with a Moroccan-inspired spice rub of cumin, ginger, coriander, and clove. There, a peppery roast squash with not just one but two salads, the first with Israeli couscous and pomegranate, and the lesser with the basic arugula and balsamic. It was a little overwhelming, and when I asked if she had made it all herself, she just laughed and said her name was Olivia. Feel free to help yourself. Hopefully some of it appeals to you. Everyone had already eaten. They'd pulled the table up to sit in the light of the porch and a dozen or more chairs were packed tight into a circle. Some of them were empty. A number of the guests plus Sydney had slipped off their shoes to go exploring in the dark. It's cold, cold grass and decorated wedding arch. I could hear someone giggling inside the big tent. One of the skinnier boys was sitting on his partner's lap, resting his cheek on top of her hair. Another girl was slouched deep in her chair, a cigarette hanging idly from each hand as she gazed skyward. My brother sat stiffly in what felt like a corner, worrying a used up wet wipe in his hand. His glass stood near the edge of the table, a single puddle of wine lingering over the dark heart of the stem. Olivia was nowhere to be seen. At last, my brother tossed the wet wipe onto his empty plate. You're late. I frowned at the way his foot jittered on his knee. Are you okay? His shoulders jerked. Then he seemed to realize how rude that was and sat up straight. He said, I'm fine, shaking his head, but he wasn't fine. It was like that time in high school when a girl he didn't even know smacked him in the face and he spent the entire day walking around in a huff saying, some people and who does that girl think she is? I gave him the same look I did then, the yes, but you don't have to be so ridiculous about it look. He recognized this and I think perhaps felt stung by it, but didn't even begin to relax until Sydney returned and placed a hand on his shoulder. He shook out a sigh, then told her, I'm ready for the night to be over. It was the most honest thing I'd ever heard him say. With Sydney at the table, the guests became suddenly animate. They were all performance performance artists, I realized, musicians and designers and dancers like Sydney, who had been lucky enough or else desperate enough to find a way of manipulating their art into something that could make money. I watched my brother as he interacted with these people. I saw the way he coiled and drew entirely into himself, tense with anxiety and perfectly aware of his inability to join the conversation. As they spoke, he nodded and hummed and occasionally said yes, but on the rare occasion when he offered something, it was only an anecdote or an inconsequential fact gleaned from a news article he'd read earlier that day. When one of them made a joke, he laughed like someone who has spent their entire life trying to understand why on earth something is funny, only to discover absurdly late that what makes the thing funny is simply that it exists. Once he found such a thing so preposterous that he bent over with his forehead in his hand, laughing and gasping for air. The artists were all amused by this. I found it condescending. At some point, I began to stare off into space. The porch light had illuminated a perimeter inside of which the million blades of, blades of grass stood pale and quivering like captive animals. If only we could turn off the light, I thought, then their poor souls would have a chance to flee, and in the morning, we would finally see the darkness underneath. I thought once more of the night Sydney and I spent together, of opening my eyes and folding back the sheet to find her already there. I couldn't control her. Her tongue moved, but not in any way that would give pleasure or that was meant to give pleasure. And when I tried to draw her attention to a particular spot, 
either the angle would shift or the pressure abate, or she'd use her teeth in a way I found dangerous and inspiring. I think part of me has always believed love should be like this, painful and hidden, only making itself known when you least expect it and are unprepared for the damage it can do. Once the pain subsided, I lay back with my eyes closed and my hands folded on my abdomen, enjoying myself. Even after I finished, Sydney continued to work on me, using broad, flat strokes that pushed at my mind and almost lulled me to sleep again. When it was over, she stretched out beside me and slipped into a deeper, less active sleep. It's amazing to think now of the calm that descended as soon as her mouth left me. As I lay there, I had the experience not of dread, but of knowing that something was dreadful was coming and that I'd have to be ready for it. So I got out of bed, I washed my face, then I returned to Sydney, holding her close and stroking her hair for as long as I could before she walked out on me again. Thank you. Daniel Pena, Cornell MFA class of 2012, is a Pushcart Prize winning author, a Fulbright Garcia Robles scholar, a former Picador guest professor in Leipzig, Germany. At present, he is professor of English at the University of Houston. Pena's writing has appeared in Plowshares, The Guardian, Kenyan Review, NBC News, in 2017, his novel, Bang, was published by Arta Publico Press. If you have not read Bang, you are in for a treat. I have always wanted to read a novel where the main character was called Kawatamatak. <laughs> the novel is by turns a vivid adventure story, a picaresque family story, a violent story of deportation, and death by quick and slow means. Pena's prose soars with details of flying crop dusters, the desert landscape and towns of northern Mexico, the orange groves of Texas, and sears with pain of longing for home, the brutality of drug cartels, the horrors of a world we have made through drug addiction and environmental degradation. But Bang is also a story of intense family loyalty, of human bonds and sacrifice, the poetry of scrapyards and junkyards, of machines and the poetry of flying. You will never forget the avalanche of baby bones from a crumbling church wall, the intimate experience of a plane crash, the smells of a hospital, the toxic slivers of Mexican history that stab through the narrative. The real theme of this compelling novel is the persistence of love in an all but impossible world. Please welcome Daniel Pena. That was a really beautiful introduction. I'm really, I'm really grateful to be here, I should say. Um, I came in last night and walked up the sort of the, that pathway to, to Goldwyn Smith, and I was really moved, you know, to see the sort of the sanctuary uh, city, no band, no wall. And it was sort of like, I'm, I'm getting a little teary-eyed. <laughs> it's a cool, it's a, I'm grateful to be here. It's cool. Uh, thank you, uh, it's the Department of English. Um, Aurora, Lynn, the arts and sciences, all my uh, mentors, and of course, Dorothy, Nick, and Ruth. Men can cry. <laughs> what is it, you guys like my scarf? Yeah, dig it. All right, I'll get into it, and then I'll, uh, I'll do some more things in a little bit. Guatemoc purges it all from his mind before his boot even touches the ground. He forgets the bloody road leading up to San Miguel. 
He forgets the private strip in Sweetwater, Texas called Fraley. Where he made his drop of cocaine, he purges his mind of looking down on Interstate 20, running east of El Paso. Those burning cars, hot, greasy diesel smoke pouring black up into a plume that screened out the sun and painted the whole scene wispy in shadows of smoke. That familiar burnt orange Ford Lobo, the one he'd ridden in so many times before from the airstrip, gushing from the undercarriage, blood and oil and gasoline in the sand, a body pouring out from the driver's side, wearing purple boots. Quatemoc knew, even from the sky, who those boots belonged to. He purges that name from his mind, too. He plants his foot on the running boards of the white Dodge Durango at the end of Nahuatl Street and climbs into the passenger seat. Any peculiarities, the driver asks him, cracking his spearmint gum. Quatemoc glasses him over. They've never met before. No, he says. Quatema keeps his stolid face, puts his hands, but his hands give him away, his finger pulling at the long, puckered scar on his left arm where it was cut the night he was deported from Texas, the night he was kidnapped and forced to fly cartel planes. Quatemoc says nothing as he eases his body into the passenger seat of the car. He turns down the radio and clicks it to the AM band, Texas High School Football, Westlake versus Copper's Cove. He takes the driver's Stetson from his dash and drapes it over his sun-wearied eyes. I can't understand English, the driver says. I know, says Quatemoc softly and lowers the brim. The engine turns over and the driver pulls out onto his side road. The driver expertly weaves through the boulders, strewn pell-mell about the streets that keep the police from navigating the neighborhood and keep the military out too. Quatemoc closes his eyes and he feels his neck fused with sweat to the hot pleather headrest. His mouth is dry, his bones are aching. The driver takes Guatemoc the long way to the safe house, which looks like all the other safe houses in Juarez. A squat, pale brown one-story, bad foundation, meandering cracks in the wall that split jagged in the cold months like sweeping bolts of lightning. Desert wasps make their homes in the seams where the warmth escapes. They breed and die. They shut up the adobe with their lives until the house takes on the fragile look of a cracked egg or like tempered glass about to shatter. Guatemoc eases his aching body from the comfort of the pleather. He moves to turn off the radio, but it's already off. He walks to the fender and slaps the number tacked on the wall of the house just for kicks. 410, all of the safe houses end in 10, 2810, 510, 4510. Guatemoc commits every safe house address he's tried to bring down with a slap of his palm to memory. The door opens, darkness pours out from the threshold. A wiry little man with ropey muscles lays out the flat of his hand. Guatemoc and the driver hand over their chirping next telephones like they do every time. The little man puts them in an oversized Ziploc bag and says, I hope all is well. Guatemoc's eyes try to adjust to the musty darkness inside, but he's nearly blind. He can only feel the little man's words on his neck now, a plume of smoke that cools just above the shirt collar and hangs there at the volume of a whisper. The driver follows behind. All is well, says Guatemoc, to no one in particular, and the door shuts behind him. How, he asked Lalo one time. And Lalo looked at Guatemoc, almost surprised, as if he didn't expect that question, or at least the audacity of it. It was only one word, how, but between the both of them, it was the most dangerous word. It was the bridge between dreaming and doing. How connected them at the brain. How was the end, but also the beginning of everything. And suddenly, it was out that they were both planning, scheming against El Jimmy. They would both leave their cartel, escape it, which, of course, carried its own obvious dangers. El Jimmy still knew where his mother and Uli were. It was a thing that kept Guatemoc from simply taking his plane and flying off into the north. It was this fear that kept him coming back, day after day, to the desert strip or the little road in Lomas de Poleo. Out with it, then, said Guatemoc, as excited ever. How? How? Lalo's answer was simple, a lot of cash. How much? A lot. More than we could ever make. From where? From everywhere, said Lalo. And he explained how uh, he kept his money in one place but never on him. He kept it at the base of the aluminum line false steering column in the burnt orange Ford Lobo. he drive across the border to Texas, that hollow space where the drugs were kept and stored. 
say from the prying eyes of x-rays, gamma rays, whatever rays reflected off the aluminum sheet inside the steering column. Other drivers drove that pickup too, but the money was still safe. Everyone knew that to steal from the cartel was a death sentence. And of course, everyone talked about the stash in the steering column, but nobody knew who it belonged to, so nobody dared take it. The other drivers assumed it was a test of sorts, of loyalty or something. Lalo got a kick out of that. He loved the idea of his money traveling to all the places drugs went, the places he might go someday after this. Houston, Wichita Falls, Oklahoma City, Tuscaloosa, Raleigh, New York, Montreal. Come with me, Lalo would say, and they make plans together. They dreamed of fancy hotels, fancy dinners, Buchanan's single malt scotch, never having to work for El Jimmy or anyone else again. Lalo told him that when it was his turn to drive the Lobo, he always checked on his money, and it was always there, packed against the back of the column, down by where the Freon hit the AC vent. The bills were always cold, and he liked to fan them in his face. The smell like plastic. Guatemoc remembers Lalo telling him all of this, and he remembers asking again, but how? So you have a lot of cash, but what do you do with it? Guatemoc remembers the crooked index finger on Lalo's hand and how it waved the bartender over with just the tiniest motion that night in the bar, the windy heat of June slapping hard against the window panes. Lalo took a 100 peso bill from his wallet, looked off toward the cantina bathroom, and said to Guatemoc, let me show you what honest men will do for money. So, so much of this book is, was like, it was advertised, obviously, as like, or marketed as like a, a cartel book, and it is, but I think central to this book is like one really um, fundamental question that I had, which is, you know, when systems strip people of dignity, can you blame people for trying to find that dignity by creating their own systems? Um, and then one observation, which is like, when markets and armies go head to head, you know, the market always wins. Of course, the black market's an army. Trump says we're going to send a, a military toward it. It's like, oh man, you know, armies always uh, always lose to the market. In the bathroom, Lalo busts his chin on his way toward the porcelain lip of the toilet. He hurls and hurls, his voice splattering echoes inside the toilet bowl that rattle out at the tile corners of the ceiling. Nothing comes up. A beaded string of spit arcs from the fleshy part of his lip to, th to the clear water below. Quauhtémoc hooks his arms under Lalo's and pulls him so he's kneeling. His chin sluices bright red. It meanders and streaks like jagged lines and stops at his collarbone. He looks as fragile as an egg and just as pale. That incredible voice, that incredible noise. Don't talk, says Quauhtémoc. Don't speak. Uh, he takes the Chinese food from the ledge of the bathtub and places it on the floor. Don't eat, he tells Lalo. They look at the mirror and they look at each other. They see themselves, Lalo, the boy he used to be, Quotemoc, the man he might become, that bloody mess, that pulp of a person. He looks at Lalo the way you might look at a car wreck, the way you might observe it and rubberneck because you don't want it to happen to you. He observes Lalo begging. Quotemoc swears when it's his time that he won't beg. Please, says Lalo, shivering in his cold clothes. Please, he says, reaching for the food, and Quatemoc lets him have it. He nibbles at the breaded chicken. He can't keep anything down. Inside the tub, the ashy cigarette from Lalo's lips, snuffed and bloated at the filter, spins slowly under the drippy faucet. Quatemoc takes off his shirt and ties it like a scarf around Lalo's neck. He pats him dry with the tail of it. He grabs him by the shoulders and blows out the candle. The sodium lamps pour in through the window and light half the tub orange. In the dark, the other half is blue. Lalo's skin is yellow, his torso cut in half. The water is green, the same shade of green Quauhtémoc remembers so well from his childhood. He eases Lalo's head into the water and closes his eyes. Lalo wraps his legs around Quauhtémoc, and Quauhtémoc lets his mind drift back in time, the warmness of Lalo's escaping breath like Texas heat in the summertime. Quauhtémoc lets his mind go elsewhere. He imagines walking barefoot in his old backyard, or what he considered his backyard at one time. It's where he played anyway, he and his little brother. It's still teeming with sounds. The tick of the heat in his ears, the tick of the insects flapping from one tree to the other, ruining everything he's ever worked for. Behind his closed eyes, there are the cicadas too, 17-year-old cicadas humming pitch perfect in the shade of the orange trees, branches, 
You can't see them, but they're there, and they'll die eventually, like all the other critters and crawlers and men and women in the grove, all poisoned by the pesticide. Lalo moans, and Cuauhtémoc brings his toes to a point. He's flexing his calves. He's bringing his body up two or three inches to the tree. He pulls down a switch and plucks a cicada from a branch. He pinches its humming legs between his fingers and dangles it away from his face as far as his arm can reach, staring at its molting body. The cicada feels the same way it did when he was seven, the last time he handled the cicada, like a sliver of metal, but undeniably alive. He remembers how he and his brother would make them fight, how he'd clip their wings and set them off against each other in a dirt ring like oversized ants. Being flightless made them hostile. They circled for a long time before they attacked one another. They made them carnivores, he and his brother. It was always a quick death. He remembers how placidly his little brother watched as one cicada would split the other open, the broken one's exoskeleton flaking like bits of fish food, and they talk over it just like teenage boys might talk over cigarettes, or old men might talk over dialysis at the Harlingen Scott and White down the road. What is the worst way someone can die? His little brother would always come up with the funny deaths. Ants getting killed by a hooker getting killed by ants and a fire and a hooker at the same time. Thank you. <laughs> when it was Quatemoc's turn, all he could think about was shriveling to death, sloughing away like that bug, molting, beautiful, and iridescent like that cicada drying in the dirt. What a slow death, he thinks. How cruel children can be. He thinks of the cicada and thinks of the drivers and thinks of Lalo and thinks of himself, disposable, just like everything else. He'll molt under hot dirt, eventually somewhere in the world. In his mind, he can see their skin sloughed off by zip ties or bullets or fire. He's suddenly conscious of his own scars all over his body, the puckered red blips of skin around his wrist from when he was kidnapped in Matamoros, the pink lacerations over his arm when he was made to fight gladiator style at midnight, the serrated bead sutures across his clavicle from when he crashed a plane for the first time with his brother. He opens his eyes and sees that face underwater, perfectly still, perfectly at peace. He imagines plucking each scar from his body to lay them over himself. He thinks he can remember what it felt like to be flawless at one time. Thank you so much. Uh, if, if you'll indulge me, I didn't get to thank uh, the Department of English, uh, uh, the Arts and Sciences, um, all my mentors here, Debbie, uh, Elena, um, where's everyone at? Uh, you know, uh, J. Robert Lynn, everyone, uh, Michael, uh, Stephanie, uh, Ernesto, and, uh, and basically uh, my, my, my readers, uh, my co-readers tonight, Dorothy, Nick, and Ruth. Uh, I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Okay, before you all stand up and, and go on to the reception or else buy their books, I just want to have two, two, uh, two points of recognition. The first one being that uh, Cornell is uh, located in uh, uh, the traditional homeland of the Cayuga Nation. And the other point of recognition is who is Philip Freun? Uh, class of 29, uh, got his master's at 30, uh, in 32. Uh, 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 an author who, who wrote 34 books, including a three-volume history of the theater. He left, uh, he left us enough to not only pay for the lectureships of some of our uh, lecturers, but now with, uh, with, with this incredible gift. I mean, the, 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 the fact that he foresaw that he wanted to, to do something not only for Cornell, but for the, the, the students and the writers. Now we have this Philip Freund uh, Creative Writing Prize for our alumni uh, that comes with a $5,000 stipend for each. So would you please come up here? I'm not going to give you your $5,000. The check is in the mail. But please come up here. Please come up here. Yes, come up here. Come, 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 come. These are our certificates for you. Oh, thank you. This is uh, yeah, Dorothy. Me. OK, here we go. Thank you. Nicholas, Ruth, and Daniel, we're so proud of you. Thank you. Now we can. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.